Hello folks, nope, I'm not doing a Flat Earth video today, that will come soon, oh yes, very soon. Instead, I found an interview between a creationist and a biochemistry graduate. Let's take a look, shall we? Caleb, have you ever heard of the discovery of soft tissue in dinosaur bones? I have not. You yep. not heard of that? Dr. Mary Schweitzer, that um, she had the this femur, the T-Rex femur, some pieces of it, and analyzed it and then discovered all these soft tissues and then published in Science Magazine 2005. I have an article that I'll give you okay. uh, before you go. I would love to see the article, but I can't, so I'll just destroy your argument without it, even though this argument has been torn down over and over again in the past. So Mary Schweitzer is a paleontologist who supposedly discovered soft tissue in dinosaur remains. However, that is not the case. Creationists came and completely misrepresented her discovery in order to further their propaganda. So basically, we found certain proteins, especially collagen, to be present within the tissue. These connected proteins are usually unable to be preserved for such a long time, so how did these proteins stay around for so long? The answer is iron. As you know, iron is very reactive and toxic as shit, if left by itself, that is. Which is why we have many mechanisms in our body to eliminate free heme if a tissue is damaged. But our body does take advantage of its reactiveness, first by limiting its activity by embedding it in polypeptide chains, then utilizing it for oxygen and electron transport. When an organism dies, it releases iron freely into the body. Now, depending on the situation and environment of the organism's death, this iron activity will vary. And in this case, the dinosaur that died so happened to have released a lot of iron with high activity, which is unusual. Now, iron has quite an interesting effect on proteins. Its properties allow the proteins to coil up, and this will ultimately protect the peptide from outside influences, just like formaldehyde. It is a preservative, and this one fossil we found seemed to have the right amount of iron to preserve the tissue for millions of years. Any uneducated creationists out there will assume it's soft tissue. It's not, it's preserved tissue. Also, it's really funny how you guys keep bringing this up, because this is actually evidence for evolution. The collagen protein that we are talking about showed similarities with collagen found in chickens and frogs, suggesting a common ancestor between the two. So please, stop bringing up this stupid argument from now on. Not only does it not support your position, it is evidence for evolution! So, um, in regard to science, um, would you agree that science is really about not proving things, but disproving things? Put it up a little higher. Sure. Um, I'd, I'd say to some extent, yes. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would say science is about kind of objective gathering of evidence. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, especially from a statistical point of view, you know, you've got some hypothesis that you're, you're trying to reject the null hypothesis. Good. So. Yes, I agree, except you are misrepresenting science just a little bit, partly because this creationist most likely doesn't understand what a null hypothesis is. We do, indeed, work to disprove the null. In fact, in statistics, the whole process revolves around the null hypothesis, and the alternative hypothesis. The null merely serves as the antagonist, if you will, and disproving it will suggest the validity of the alternative hypothesis, which is what our main concern is. For example, if I want to prove that sunlight increases the risks of skin cancer, then the null hypothesis is that sunlight does not affect the risks. In this case, we are not performing science just to actively seek out and disprove the idea that sunlight doesn't affect the risks of cancer. Instead, our motivation and drive of experimentation stems from the alternative hypothesis, which states that sunlight does have an effect. We want to see if the statement is true or not. In this sense, yes, we are seeking to disprove the null, but that's not what drives the experiment. What drives the experiment is our desire to prove something, the alternative hypothesis. When it comes to evolution, do you think that evolution should that scientists should try to disprove evolution? Um, so I, I suppose I would say that that should always be an option. That if, if some evidence uh, is introduced that would disprove that, then I, I would expect most scientists to kind of look at that rationally and either, um, you know, either decide if that disproves some tenets or, you know, fundamental tenets or, or what. Right, okay. Science challenges everything, even our own theories that we developed. We have challenged it over and over again to the most meticulous detail, and that's how it became a theory. A creationist such as this old guy over here would never understand the rigorous process informing the theory. 
If evidence appeared that would make us doubt the validity of evolution itself, or Darwin's theory, we would jump to it immediately. Of course, since evolution is so concrete, the first thing we would do is attempt to explain anything that contradict our theory. However, if there really was proof against evolution, it would be revolutionary. Scientists would present it immediately and obtain their Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened yet, and it's been 150 years already. Can you provide some empirical evidence? What is your favorite empirical evidence for evolution? My fucking god, you're asking him to pick his favorite one out of like millions? You fucking nuts, mate? Let me just answer this myself first. It's not really my favorite one, but I like to use it because creationists out there are so stupid they can't understand it. Like, they expect you to say something like DNA or fossils, but it's fun to give them something more specific and watch them have nothing to say. Anyway, I'm going to say viral genetics. You see, viruses infect cells by inserting their DNA or RNA within the host. They then use various enzymes to force the cell into producing more viral DNA and proteins, but in various cases, the viruses must have the genetic information that is compatible to that of the host. This can be in the form of viral genetics itself, or in the form of proteins. Since animals evolve, viruses must too, but not all of it. Some of this viral DNA that was useful to infecting cells in the past are still present today, locked away in viruses. And what we have done is that we dug up this viral DNA and compared it to our evolutionary tree of ancestry. And guess what we found? It modeled it perfectly. I'll let you think about what that means by yourself. Anyway, let's see what this guy in the video has to say about his favorite piece of evidence for evolution. I would say the development of the eye is a really, um, a really compelling piece that shows how structures can develop from something really basal where all you have is sort of a surface on certain organisms that that collects light um, and produces um, you know arguably not even an image and then you know develops into kind of like a fluid filled pit and um, you know eventually you get cornea and lens and things becoming more and more exact over different kinds of organisms until you end up with something you know like a human eye. It's ironic how you brought up the eye, since a lot of creationists also bring that up, claiming that it's so perfect that there must have been a designer. I personally wouldn't have brought this up to prove evolution, since it's really part of a mapped out process rather than evidence. But anyway, the eye is a perfect example of how it couldn't have come from intelligent design. The photoreceptors are faced backwards. The receptors itself are facing inside, while the horizontal, bipolar, and ganglion cells intercept the pathway of light to the receptors. This is highly inefficient, since light can easily be blocked before they reach the photoreceptors. A perfect god would not have made a design so poor. However, this inefficient structure does suggest evolution, and I think this would have been a better point to bring up rather than just the process of the eye evolving. See, evolution isn't perfect. It messes up. But one thing it does encompass is natural selection's ability to make things work. The eye had its photoreceptors and supporting cells flipped around. Natural selection doesn't attempt to correct this, but rather just make it work. I believe Richard Dawkins briefly mentioned this in one of his debates. Anyway, there are so many imperfect instances that we could find in the body, but I won't go through all of them now. Let's just see what the creationist has to say. To me, that's not empirical evidence, because what you're talking about is a story. You're talking about, well, it begins with this, uh, this dot that may be uh, photosensitive and then evolves into something more sophisticated, which evolves into something more sophisticated. But is there empirical evidence showing the evolution? I have to admit that the example he brought up was indeed not a very good one, but it wouldn't have mattered what he said. You would have still said it's not empirical evidence anyway. Cause you're a fucking creationist. Um, I mean, when, when you're looking at anything historical, you know, be it formation of geology or, you know, looking at the way climate was in the past, you can never have um, purely empirical evidence because, you know, all we can look at is um, is records. Oh my god, no, just stop. Just because we observed something after it happened doesn't mean it's not empirical evidence. I'm not saying that our conclusion of evolution is reached only from empiricism. It does require some thinking and deducing, but that doesn't mean it's 100% void of empirical observation. For example, we reproduced evolution on a small scale in labs. Is that not empirical? Natural selection is proven all the time. 
But that's just fucking macroevolution, right? What about a larger scale? Well, there's still plenty of empirical observations being done there, from analyzing fossils to DNA and even proteins. Sure, we would need some sort of logical reasoning to reach the conclusion, but the empirical evidence is there. Um, you know, fossils or organisms that still exist nowadays that we can, we can kind of hypothesize are analogous to organisms that have lived in the past. Um, so, you know, depending on your definition, I would argue that you can never have empirical evidence. Sure, yes, it would depend on how you define empirical evidence, so let's not dwell on that. Okay, um, I would disagree with that. Shocker! There's, uh, so I'm a creationist, putting my cards on the table. Sure. All right, and I believe that there is a variety of evidence in favor of creation, not proving creation, but it is empirical evidence that can be shown over and over again. <laughs> these hilarious motherfuckers making these outrageous claims. Can I share a couple of them with you? No. Um, yeah, I've, I've probably only got one or two more minutes, but, okay, that's but yeah, fine. I'd be curious to hear no, what you have to sure. say. Sure, okay. You're familiar with, I'm, I know you're familiar with abiogenesis, right? Sure, yep. All right. So, but is there any empirical evidence for abiogenesis? Um, I, I would say no, actually, and that right now it's a theory kind of based on, on the best evidence, but, um, but yeah, I, I think most scientists would agree that that is pretty speculative at this point. Okay, and it is, extremely so. Sure. Oh, so we're going to jump back and forth between evolution and abiogenesis now? Firstly, even if you disprove abiogenesis without a shadow of a doubt, evolution would still hold true. I don't care if life began from an all-powerful god or from a giant pink dancing elephant, it wouldn't dent evolution one bit. Evolution only says that organisms change over time. Second, abiogenesis cannot be observed, I'll give you that one, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Any abiogenesis that does occur today would be outcompeted by organisms that have already evolved to adapt to the environment. That's why we generally don't see it happening today. However, it's also important to realize that early earth conditions were greatly different than what it is now. There have been numerous experiments mimicking early earth conditions and just letting it sit. What we found was that we can form all the essential amino acids as well as many other crucial organic compounds. There's no reason to believe this couldn't lead to life, especially considering it could take a very long time to do so. This is our best hypothesis for how life began on earth. I would go into more detail on this topic, but we're already over 10 minutes, so let's wrap this up. In the contrast is the law of bio biogenesis. It is a law, and we see that life comes from life every single day. Sure. And so, to me, that is evidence in favor of creation. That's just one piece of evidence. No, no, that's not evidence. It's funny how you guys bring up science to disprove science. Let me explain. The original intention of the law of biogenesis was to counter spontaneous generation. A long time ago, people didn't store their foods properly, and organisms such as mold started to grow on their food. They couldn't figure out where these organisms came from, so they just thought it was due to spontaneous generation because they didn't know about contamination. Keep in mind that this is not the same as abiogenesis. Spontaneous generation only refers to complex modern organisms, while abiogenesis describes creating simple organisms from non-living materials, specifically for the origin of life. Now, the law of biogenesis specifically is a counter to spontaneous generation, meaning it only describes complex life, not simple life originating from abiogenesis. Therefore, the law of biogenesis does not disprove the origin of life. The other one that I'm going to bring up, because I know you you're want to get going, and I want to give you this article, is just to say again, uh, dinosaur soft tissue. So dinosaurs, theoretically, according to evolution, are dated at 65 plus million years. Sure. Okay. Now, this particular dinosaur was dated at 68 million years, but soft tissue should not last more than a few thousand years old. Uh, there are mummies of human remains, you know, where they've been able to find soft tissue. But, and they're able to you know, somewhat date you know, these things. But scientists know biology well enough to know how it decays that we know that uh, biology should not be lasting millions of years. Okay. So this became extremely controversial when it was first announced in Science Magazine 2005. 
Well, I already explained this in the beginning of the video. This is actually pretty funny, really. There are so many fossils out there, and you find one that supposedly fits in with your creation delusions, and you jump straight to it saying, Look, look, evolution is false. Like, come the fuck on, man. If this were really true, don't you think it would have had more of an impact? That scientists would have just realized the so-called falsehood of evolution? If we really found real valid evidence that suggested the dinosaur died only a few thousand years ago, we would get right on board to see what the fuck's going on. Don't think that your little hijack of these findings is enough to prove creation. The only thing it proves is your dishonesty.